Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 7th, 2014, and my guest is Nathan Lecharzik, co-founder and chief technology officer of Airbnb. This has been the summer of the sharing economy here at Econ Talk. We even had a recent episode with Barry Weingast on law that ended up touching on the sharing economy. We had Mike Munger and I pontificating as academics about its significance, and uh, we're closing out the summer with uh, arguably the most important, certainly one of the most important uh, firms of the sharing economy, Airbnb. So, Nathan, uh, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. What is the business proposition for guests and hosts uh, at Airbnb? How does Airbnb make money? And just give us the basic uh, logistics of how it works. Sure. We have 800,000 properties around the world in 192 different countries. These are properties that are offered by individuals. They're their primary homes. They're offering them either while they're away uh, on vacation or business. Um, And sometimes they're actually renting out rooms in their homes. So there's all different types of properties that we make just as easy to book as a hotel for guests. Uh, And so we now have guests from around the world booking these accommodations. A big part of what we have done is take the friction out of the process. What I mean by that is you come to our site, you search a place like Paris, you'll see 30,000 different homes in Paris in which you could stay. Uh, You can read the reviews that were left by past guests. And if you find something you like, you can book it online. Uh, You enter your payment information, you pay Airbnb, uh, and the host does not get paid until after you arrive. That way, if you need to cancel or you show up and something's not as described, all you have to do is call Airbnb's customer support, and we can give you your money right back. So this builds a lot of peace of mind for both the guest and the host, knowing that the, the payment is secure and that there's the profiles and the reviews. And it has really allowed uh, this activity to thrive. I mean, six years ago, nobody was doing this. And just last Saturday, we had 375,000 guests staying in other people's homes in a single night. It reminds me a little bit of a MOOC where you have hundreds of thousands of of students taking a course online. You have the world's largest hotel, in a sense, except the rooms are distributed out into the world. Uh, And that's, uh, that's really remarkable. Just a clarifying question, a couple. What proportion, roughly, of the rooms that you rent are while the person's, the, the host is staying there versus the, the entire house itself? Because that's a very different thing than a hotel. Usually you don't have a roommate. So I'm curious how that, and if it's changed at all over time. The majority of the inventory and the bookings are for entire places. I would say about 30% of the time uh, the guest is choosing to stay in a home uh, in an extra bedroom or, or such. So there's definitely both taking place, uh, but the majority of the time people opt to get the entire home. And what's the take? Uh, what's the commission for Airbnb to make this as seamless as it is, which is really remarkable. I'm staying, by the way, here at, for the summer out in the Bay Area, and uh, for the first time we're using Airbnb Perfect. because Craigslist had virtually no listings. You've, you've taken that marketplace, basically taken it over for a bunch of reasons. Um, so tell us how that works. What's your take and... Um, uh, how, how does the, how much is it? So the guest pays a service fee that's between 6 and 12%. So the higher the overall spend, the lower the percentage. And the host pays a flat 3%. And how do you prevent, so the, we're renting a, an entire house from a, a, a family that's off in Europe this, this, for the same amount of time that we're here. Um, how, let's say we want to come back next summer, which we do, to the Bay Area and if we could save that 9% by just making a private arrangement. Now, that wouldn't be the end of the world for, because you got a good commission the first time, but there is repeat business, obviously. How do you, how do you provide something of value that's bigger than that, ideally bigger than that 9%? Sure. Well, the percentage is low to begin with, but after each transaction, the guest reviews the host and the host reviews the guest. So both parties walk away from the transaction having... Uh, gotten a review. 
And that review has real value because it's that review. Wait a minute. You're saying I'm going to get reviewed? You're going to get reviewed too. Darn. I knew my kids should have behaved better. No, that's just, that's a joke. My kids did a really good job this summer, not breaking anything. Go ahead, sir. But because you get that review, you're going to be more trustworthy in the future when you ask to book someone else's home. So this whole marketplace is based on trust. And so the reviews are a critical currency uh, for getting access to people's homes. And so that right there has some values. Most hosts will appreciate uh, paying the fee in order to get a additional review, as well as the convenience of how we handle the money. Yeah, that's what I'm interested in. So, for example, let's say um, one issue, of course, is I come back next year. Let's say it's not on Airbnb. We make a private deal on the side, and the house is a wreck. It's a mess. I have no recourse. It's a lot less pleasant. Obviously, you're going to take care of me. At least that's the plan under the current system. What? How do you? The other issue, though, that happens when you rent a house, and I've done this for uh, 10 summers now, so I've seen the whole range of challenges that arise even when honest, well-intentioned people interact in the marketplace without a contract or at least without a well-perfectly specified contract. Let's say um, you know they come back from their vacation and they find that we've broken something and we say we didn't break it or we say, yeah, we broke it, but it was old and it was falling apart anyway. And how do you handle those kind of uh, disputes? Sure. Well, uh, most importantly, we have a million dollar, what we call host guarantee, uh, which means up to $1 million if something is broken or stolen, uh, Airbnb will cover that for you. Um, so that gives tremendous peace of mind. Now, we can only provide that because it happens so infrequently. And why does it happen infrequently? Well, the reviews certainly help, uh, as well as the guest knows that Airbnb has your payment information on file. I mean, it's like going to a hotel, right? You put your credit card at the front desk, uh, and it's expected that if you mess up the room, you're going to pay for that. They know who you are. Likewise, Airbnb knows who you are. And this just creates the right incentive structure for everyone to be on their best behavior. The challenge comes when there's disagreements, though. So do you have some way to adjudicate disputes when things don't go as expected? So, uh, again, uh, you know, that I... I come back, they blame me for something I claim I didn't do. do you, whose word do you take? Do you have a system for dealing with that? Sure. Well, that's incredibly rare, but when it does happen, that's what our customer support is there for. So you can call us, uh, we'll mediate between the two parties, uh, and we'll do our best to resolve it. And in the event where uh, you know, it just can't be reconciled, we do have certain guarantees in place that is kind of the catch-all safety net. How much do you worry about a disaster, a really bad piece of publicity. Um, and this happens in all the examples of the sharing economy. It happens with Uber. It happens with Airbnb. Something goes, not just a broken lamp, something goes dreadfully wrong and uh, alarms people about the safety of, say, renting a stranger's house. Uh, have you had those issues? How worried are you about those? And uh, how worried were your investors when you first got started? Certainly in the beginning, that was the first thing that came to anybody's mind when they heard about this idea. Uh, they'd say, this is a terrible idea. Somebody's going to get hurt. Something's going to be damaged. Uh, what's amazing is that each night we have up to 375,000 other people staying in someone else's home for the first time and how remarkably smooth that goes. Uh, so the vast majority of stays have no problem whatsoever. Uh, at our scale, occasionally there are issues that arise. Some of these have uh, showed up in the press. Um, it's easy to get the wrong idea by seeing those headlines, and certainly the press gravitates towards sensationalism. I love it. Uh, but that is definitely not representative, uh, and you got to put it in the context of 375,000 guests every single night. But, of course, people – the press isn't the only part of our world that overreacts. Sometimes people overreact, so you don't worry about that when you get that kind of press that, that future users are going to be alarmed or – well, to be honest, we, we do get a lot of press in general, and the vast majority of that is quite positive. Um, so I, I do think there is a, a pretty good balance, at least right now. Let's talk about your competition. Um, you were preceded by something uh, that's still out there, VRBO, which is vacation rental by owner. Obviously, there are people who use vacation rental by owner for overnight stays for business uh, and vice versa. There are people who obviously use you for vacations – so they're, they're a competitor in some dimension. They're an online provider of people trying to rent their own houses to people who they don't know very well, and they rely on reviews just like you do. So that's one kind of competition. The other kind of competition is 
Airbnb squared, some newcomer that comes along and says, we're going to do what Airbnb does. We're going to do it better, cheaper, et cetera. What's your competitive edge, do you think, that prevents uh, that second thing from happening? And do you see any of these other folks out there as real competitors? Sure. Well, those are two very different types of, we'll call them competitors. Uh, with regards to the direct clones that have been inspired by our success, and there's been many of them, and some of them have raised as much as $100 million dollars to try to take this model and grow it in other countries. Uh, one of the special things about this business are the, the strong international network effects. In other words, what makes Airbnb a great product um, is not so much the website, although I will say as one of the engineers behind it, it's a good website. It's a beautiful website. works very well. Big challenge, but, obviously, to do that well. But the product is not the website. The product is the 800,000 properties around the world in which you can stay. That's ultimately what people are paying for uh, and appreciating. And so when you have that kind of scale, that kind of selection, uh, that's where people are going to want to do their shopping. And so to take this model and try to do the same thing in another country, when the people of that country are going to want to travel internationally, they're instantly going to want to use whichever site has the global footprint. But let's do it here. Let's start in the, in the United States, which has a big chunk of your business. I'm going to start a competitor that does exactly what you do, and I'm only going to charge, uh, say, 1% and 5%. I'm going to charge less, and people are going to have those 800,000 loyal renters of yours, landlords, are going to switch to this new site. What's going to stop them? Well, the thing about the hosts are that, at most, they have 365 units to sell per year, nights per year to sell. And if we can do that effectively for them, then they don't need any other website in which to do that. And there is a certain switching cost to being on multiple, multiple platforms at once. Uh, and so we are quite effective in providing demand for our owners, for our hosts. And so there isn't really a need uh, for a, uh, a competing service, a directly competing service. No, I agree. Uh, but I'm, I'm pushing you to think, maybe you don't want to say, what about your technology? Obviously, those demanders, which are really what, right now what you provide on the surface, but what you really provide is an interface for those demanders to find those suppliers, yeah. right? That, that, as an economist, it's just an utterly fascinating thing. It's a classic example of how the lowering of transaction costs allows people to interact commercially in really spectacular ways. Because, you know, I think... Probably there are days when you think about your business as I'm helping people find a cheap place to stay. What you're really doing is making it easier for people to travel and see loved ones and do their business and a thousand really extraordinary things that are much more than just, oh, I got a cheap room tonight. So it's really a glorious thing. But the technology uh, is, is, is you really got to be your edge. What do you think you do well that would be hard for somebody to copy? Right. We certainly have the most efficient, we'll call it clearinghouse uh, or marketplace uh, in kind of economic terms. And what makes that so efficient is the payment system. It is the reputation system. And it's not just the technology of those components, but the fact that the reputation system, you accrue reviews. And so uh, that builds value, which is uh, kind of contained within, within the platform. Uh, we're also have teams of engineers that focus on matching and search. So it's all about understanding what is the, the customer's need, the guest's need, and displaying the relevant inventory. You have to remember that of those 800,000 properties, every single one of those properties are unique. And so we really need to understand our inventory well in terms of what it offers, what it doesn't offer, and match what's appropriate to the traveler. Let's go back to the early days. Um, we had Sam Altman on from the Y Combinator earlier this summer, part of our sharing economy yes, series, uh, un unplanned. Uh, and he talked uh, about some of the challenges you guys faced. Uh, it didn't go very well at the beginning. So tell, tell us what, what, went, uh, what went wrong. Why was it so hard? And uh, how, were there parts of that experience where you thought we aren't going to make it? And did you really eat cereal for, was it breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or just breakfast? Because if it's just breakfast, it's not that impressive. If it was all day long, I am impressed. <laughs> we did eat a lot of cereal. Uh, I'll get to that part of the story. The original inspiration for Airbnb came in October 2007, and we were really just solving our own problem. 
and that is that the rent on our apartment was raised 25%, and I decided to move out. The other two guys wanted to stay, and they didn't have enough money to pay the rent. They're both designers, and they saw that a design conference was coming to San Francisco, and they noticed that all the hotels were sold out. So they decided to rent out that extra bedroom to designers who needed a place to stay. And so that weekend, not only did they make about $1,000, and not only did the designers find a place to stay in a city that otherwise had no hotel rooms, but they all went to the conference together. Joan Bryant showed them around the city. It was just a, a great time for all. And they stayed in touch afterwards. And so based on that one experience, we thought to ourselves, we must be able to do this for other people in other situations. So that's kind of what we set out to do in early 2008. The great thing about that example, of course, is that it's natural. Maybe it shouldn't be, but it, it seems somehow more natural to stay with other designers who are going to the same conference you're going to. It seems safer. It seems more normal, right? So was that your original idea? Let's find groups that have natural synergies that are going to be more trusting? Right. So that, that was a great almost icebreaker uh, to bring two otherwise strangers together. And that was certainly a big part of our focus in the beginning. And actually, when we launched the site officially in August of 2008, it was for the Democratic National Convention being held in Denver. And that's where uh, Barack Obama received the uh, presidential nomination for the Democratic Party. And it was a historic event. It was being held at a stadium that held 80,000 people, yet only had 17,000 hotel rooms in the surrounding area. And so... So people were, people were staying in Arizona. <laughs> without, right. People <laughs> were flying in just for the day for this. Uh, and people... We're not doing this on business. They were doing this because they personally were so devoted and uh, supportive. So they didn't necessarily have a lot of cash. And they were looking for alternatives. So we launched in this context our website. And there were also a lot of locals that were looking to get out of town, actually, uh, right, to escape the influx. And, the traffic. And we accumulated 800 properties for this event. Uh, we're able to host many guests. And so events are a great catalyst for Airbnb. And actually, just... Just recently, during the World Cup down in Brazil, uh, we hosted uh, about 150,000 guests uh, in Brazil. It was actually about 20% of all international visitors stayed on an Airbnb uh, property. We now have 20,000 properties in the city of Rio. Uh, so Airbnb is a great solution when there's an event uh, that brings in an influx of, of, of people and there's a lack of the existing hotel capacity to kind of flux and accommodate all that. Yeah, it's so the classic economic jargon that it's a peak load problem. You don't really want to have enough ho hotel capacity in a distant part of Brazil. Every You'd like it to be come and go every, well, not every four years because Brazil doesn't host the World Cup every four years, every, say, 32 years. Can't do that, so prices go spike up on the regular hotels. And what you've done is ease the supply in a way without having, and it disappears again. It's a beautiful application of economic uh, way of thinking. And it's a great solution for cities because cities want to host these events. They, they want the visitors, uh, they want the visitors to spend their money, um, but the, the cities don't want to build capacity uh, for demand that's not going to be there on an everyday basis. Is it true that, that New York has about the same number of hotel rooms as Chicago, by the way? That may be true. New York has, oh, about 110,000 hotel rooms. I'm not sure how many Chicago has. Cause if that's shocking, right? Because more people want to stay overnight in New York than Chicago. Chicago's a fine town. I went to school there. No, nothing against it. But uh, you'd think the ongoing demand for New York would be much higher. And, of course, that's one of the reasons New York's a very expensive place to stay overnight. Right. And there's a lack of real estate available to build those additional hotels. So, And I suspect there's some other barriers to building those hotels Zoning. I, I suspect to build a new hotel in New York is a long takes a long time. Uh, so you started off with this idea that okay, special events, special uh, situations, you could maybe convince people to stay with st in strangers' houses. Uh, that sounds appealing, but didn't go so well at first, right? And, mm -hmm. and what went wrong? That's right. So for the first year, all of 2008, we were working on this. We launched it about halfway through the year. This whole time, we were trying to raise some money because, of course, we had quit our jobs, so we weren't making any, any revenue of, uh, from, from work or from our business. Uh, and so we were financing the company off of our credit cards and hoping that we could raise venture capital. 
And all the investors thought, this is, this is not a product I would use. This is probably a small market, if at all a market. And so they weren't interested. And then to make things worse, the recession began in September of 2008. And then there just weren't any investors, period. And so by the end of 2008, we were in debt. Uh, we had been without jobs for a year. We were making no more than $200 a week. We were on the verge of collapsing and quitting. What did your parents think? <laughs> My parents, uh, for the first probably few years, thought this was a crazy idea. And my dad would ask questions like, so uh, so how much longer do you think you're going to be doing this, yeah, right? It's kind of a like... passive aggressive question. Right, let's, <laughs> let's pull the plug. <laughs> yeah. So it was very difficult. And it was during this time and towards the end of this time that one of our mentors suggested to us that we join a program called Y Combinator. Y Combinator is an accelerator program for startups. It's, it's really just a 13-week program in which they give you about $20,000 uh, and a little bit of structured mentorship. And it culminates in what's known as Demo Day, where you get to pitch a room full of investors. And so our, our advisor, he said, this is a program I went through. I think it would be good for you. It would pull the team together, re-energize you, and you know, really focus you. Because we had realized that today, although we had been working very hard, we hadn't been giving 100%. We were in different geographies. Uh, we each had some side commitments. And we said, for 13 weeks... We are going to be um, like soldiers on this project, and we're going to all live in the apartment again together. We are going to get up at 8 together, go to bed at midnight. We're going to work six days a week and really drive this to demo day uh, and see where we can take it. And it was during Y Combinator that things turned around for us. Uh, was that, when, did, when were you eating the cereal? <laughs> so the cereal is probably the low point in the story, right around the time of the recession. Uh, so what happened there was... At the time, our company wasn't Airbnb. It was air bed and breakfast. And that's because that first weekend when we hosted the designers, that room we offered up to them actually had no bed. And so Joe set up an air bed. And instead of calling it a bed and breakfast, he called it an air bed and breakfast. And so that's where the name today comes from. And back then, we were actually known as airbedandbreakfast.com. Very long URL. Yeah, and some of you have that still in your email, I noticed. So we, one night, Joe and Brian got this crazy idea to uh, basically make a parody of our name and focus on the breakfast aspect of the URL. And this is shortly after the Democratic National Convention. So we had this political theme in our minds. We said, you know, what, what would we serve our guests in the morning? Um, and we came up with the ideas of Obama O's and Captain McCain's. Uh, Captain McCain's was a, a maverick in every bite. And Obama's was hope in every bowl. And so they came up with this concept and they found uh, a, a printer to print 500 boxes of each. They did original artwork for these boxes. We actually went to the store and bought regular cereal and repackaged it into our cereal boxes, hot glued it all together, and set up a website where we could sell these for $40 a box. But we sent the first 100 of each box uh, to reporters that we had met uh, through the course of our, our debut in August. And so we knew if we emailed the reporters, they would just delete our email. But we also thought if we sent them this physical box of cereal that was so incredibly witty and, and beautiful, that they would call us back, back and ask us, what's the story behind this thing? And this is building up to the election in November. And so there was a lot of uh, kind of excitement and crazy stuff happening in this buildup. And so sure enough, within a week, we were on Good Morning America. We were on CNN International doing a video interview. That day, we were the number one political video of the day on CNN.com, featured on the homepage. That day, we sold a $40 box of cereal every three minutes. And by the end of the week, we had sold out $30,000 worth of cereal. And so we like to say that in the first year, we made more money off of cereal than we did by far the core concept of Airbnb. But were you eating the cereal? <laughs> well, Sam, Sam Altman's version is that you, were, you had all those leftover dollar store cereal you're eating. So the Obama <laughs> sold out. The Captain McCain's did not. So we probably well, not afford- everybody wants a maverick in every bite, but they do want hope in every bowl. And that says a lot about cereal and Politics, probably. Go ahead. Sorry. Maybe we could have predicted the election outcome uh, <laughs> through our cereal sales. Uh, we had some extra 
Captain McCain's. And uh, this is now November, December of 2008. This is you know, the absolute low point. It's been a year now without any income. And we have all these cereal boxes around us, but no money for food. And one evening, Brian just grabbed one of the cereal bags, ripped it open, and just grabbed with his hands the cereal out of it and started eating it. Uh, that was kind of the level of desperation, uh, almost kind of like a pure animal instinct sort of uh, survival mode. No milk. No milk. Okay. There's no money for milk. <laughs> so you went through the Y Combinator, you, you pushed really hard, you went to Demo Day, and, and you had to get chosen by Y Combinator, of course. And you know, what Sam said is that he was really, they were all really impressed with the determination, that that was really important. They maybe didn't, weren't so convinced the idea was going to work out, but they figured you guys were probably pretty, pretty talented and that would probably eventually maybe lead to something. But well, that's I, a funny story, actually. So let me just take a minute to, to share it. So we go to, to pitch Paul Graham, who runs the program at this time, and you only have about five minutes to pitch him. Uh, so we go in there very much prepared to talk about what we're doing. And within two minutes, the conversation goes off track. And, and, and Paul Graham basically interjects and says, I can't believe anyone's doing this. That's crazy. I wouldn't do that. And then he basically proceeds to try to convince us to do something else. And so the remaining time goes by basically him doing the talking, telling about what he wants us to do. And so five minutes flew by. As we were walking out, Joe pulled out of his bag a box of the Obamas and said, PG, this is for you. That's and Paul Graham. Paul Graham, that's right. And Paul said, wait, I don't understand. You bought this for me? And Joe said, no, we, we made this. And he's like, uh, I don't understand. Tell me more. And so we actually sat back down and we told him the story of how we made the Obama O's and Captain McCain's. And he said, if you guys can figure out a way to sell $30,000 worth of cereal <laughs> and figure out how to make that, uh, then I'm sure you'll figure out uh, a, a business, uh, business model for, for what you're doing. And so based purely on that and the hustle he saw in, in that initiative and based nothing on the idea that we pitched him, he led us into the program. So just as a side note, um, I've been thinking a lot lately about luck versus skill and how, many, how much of our outcomes are based on our efforts and how much are just random. And so here's a case where if whoever pulled that, that box of cereal out, I don't know if that was your plan originally, that was pretty fortuitous, right? There's a decent chance that if you hadn't done that, if you had, certainly if you hadn't made the cereal, we wouldn't have Airbnb. Do you ever think about that? And do you think about how much of where we're sitting right now and a nice set of incredibly um, hip and, and airy and beautiful offices here in, in San Francisco, whether uh, there for the grace of God or bad luck, you might be, you might be back doing something else. Well, there's certainly lots of, opportunities such that had they turned out otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. So super appreciative of all those things that went right along the way. What I'll say about the, the kind of question around uh, kind of luck versus uh, kind of skill. Effort. Yeah, is that I think luck is happening all around us every day. And it's the skill is recognizing when it's happening and seizing the moment. And to go a layer deeper on that story, when I saw Joe putting the cereal into his bag, I told Joe, don't, don't bring the cereal. Like, that's, that's not what we're here to do. We're, we're here to pitch him on our business. Uh, and to me, at the time, the cereal represented basically us getting distracted. Um, it's true we made $30,000, but it's also true that it took two months. And it also is true that we, we promised royalties on it. And so we only pocketed 10,000 of the 30,000. So when you actually computed the ROI of that, it didn't really make sense. And so, but Joe insisted on bringing it anyways. And, you know, good for him for recognizing the right moment to pull that out and seeing that through. I might not have seen that opportunity. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great, that's a great observation. So, so you go through the Combinator, you get to Demo Day, and did you raise money at that point? Did you get... Right. So and, and let me ask it a different way. What time are we at right now in the this, calendar? When is this? This is now between February and about March 2009. So you've been trying for how long at this point? Over a year. So we're about 14, 15 months in. And what's your revenue at this point? $200 a week. Yeah. From, from, that's your take from the 
people using the website right. so that's, far? That's our money, $200 a week uh, that we're putting into the bank account starting from basically August through basically January. And it was during Y Combinator that we figured out really how to, what the value proposition was and how to drive that value proposition. And so between the start of Y Combinator from $200 a week, we ended up 13 weeks later at $4,500 a week. Wow. From stuff that you learned in that 13 weeks or stuff that you came to realize. That's right. It wasn't just that things started to percolate. You, you did something different. That's right. I, there were a number of thought-provoking questions that were raised. Actually, the first time we met with Paul Graham, once the program started, uh, he asked us a question of, where are all your users? And we said, well, they're kind of spread out everywhere. And he said, well, where are most of them? And we said, in New York. And he said, well, why aren't you in New York right now? He said, well, because we're here at Y Combinator, like you told us to be. And he said, doesn't matter. Go to New York. I want you to meet all your users. And that wasn't intuitive to us at the time because we didn't have any money to do that. And, and besides, they're users on the web. You don't really need to – you already know them fine, right? You could right, say. right. I mean, the whole idea behind a web business is that it's scalable. You don't need to meet your users. But he said it's okay to do things that don't scale when you're just starting out. So he said go to New York, meet your users. So Paul was a guest uh, here in 2009 uh, on Econ Talk, and he's a very creative guy. And one of the things I know he pushes is is to get a small group of people to really love your product. And I, he may have learned that from the Airbnb experience, but he probably picked it up also from other uh, startups he's worked with. So when you went to New York, uh, you found stuff out. What did you find out that was important? Right. So what he said and, and uh, was originally quoted, I think, by Paul Bukite, Bukite the creator of Gmail, is that it's a hundred it's better to have 100 users who love you than 1,000 users who like you, right? So find your core evangelists, build product for them. So we went to New York, and before we showed up, we called every single user, every single host. And we said... Uh, How many were there? Uh, about 30. Okay, okay. <laughs> so fine, that's 30. It okay. was not a monumental task <laughs> by any means. And we said, how would you like a professional photographer to come by your home and take some pictures? And I think that question was a little bit out of the blue, but people were curious and they said, it's free? Said, yes. And they said, okay, sure, why not? And you have to remember at this time, camera phones weren't that great. So they were lower resolution, uh, poorly lit. So we noticed the photos could be better. And so we offered to take them, have a professional take them for free. Uh, what ended up happening was that Joe and Brian would go to the camera store, rent the camera for the weekend, and show up themselves knocking on the door. And so the host would open the door expecting the professional photographer, and it was Joe and Brian, the founders of the company. Um, but they let, it, let them in anyways, and Joe and Brian took the photos. And while they're in there, sat with them at the computer, showed them how to use the website, got product feedback, uh, as well as invited them to, have, to share beers later on. And so we'd get together anywhere from you know, five to eight people in the evening, have a beer, tell them our story over the last year. And once people had heard the story and gotten to meet us, they became our evangelists, right? They wanted us to succeed at that point. And so much so that even once we came back to San Francisco, we could call them up and give them advice, such as, you really have a beautiful apartment, but you've only written a paragraph describing it. Can we add a few more paragraphs? Uh, can we perhaps start with your price being lower and then raise it if you're getting too many inquiries? And so once we had great pictures, lower prices, more complete profiles, and cooperative hosts, that was the special combination. It was then that those properties started getting booked by travelers coming from all around the world. The travelers had great experiences and then would go home to their home cities of Paris, Berlin, Hong Kong. And the guests would oftentimes say, hey, I want to do this too. And the guests would become hosts. And so within months, there was a global cross-pollination of the idea in a way that might not be true of, of other businesses. Do you ever kick anybody off the site, or does it just that users don't use them? When you get somebody who's, I don't know, not desirable, what do you do? Well, that's the value of the review system. And so after every transaction, both parties are reviewing each other. They can leave public feedback, private feedback for each other, and private feedback for Airbnb. And so we carefully monitor the scores and the private feedback. And if we identify uh, a, a problem, then, of course, they're dealt with and removed. So let's talk about scaling. Um, you've got your 100 people who love you, 
and now you want to go to 800,000 or whatever. I don't know how many you have in New York. You have you had 30 then. I'm sure you have more than 30 now, right? Um, two things. What are the challenges there, in particular in terms of that coaching? When you have 30 people, you can say things like add a paragraph. Do you give advice in some form? Like if I'm entering my description of my house and I only write a paragraph to you, then do you, does, the tech, does the software prompt you to say, do you want to say more or other things like that? How do you handle that scaling? So we were obviously very hands-on in the beginning, and you can only do that for so long. But here's the magical thing. If you set a strong, positive example amongst the core set of users, when new users found out about it, they would come onto the service, look around their neighborhood, see the high quality of properties and the great photographs and the affordable prices, and they would say, oh, that's what I have to do to be competitive. Yeah, that's my competition. Right. That's my competition. And so it created a really high bar to begin with. Now, of course, we offer contextual help within the software uh, to give more detail. But uh, this whole incentive system creates the right behaviors. Let's talk a little bit about a, a, one particular issue that's very interesting to me, which is um, uh, real identification. So when I get onto your site, I, I think I have to be who I am, or at least that's the idea, right? And this is a you know, Facebook claims to do it. You can you can create a fake Facebook per, uh, persona. I, I don't know how easy or hard it is. Um, but but we're moving toward a world where people have their, well, let's say it differently. There's two parts to the internet. The parts where people are anonymous and troll and do dark and private and wonderful things, but they do it anonymously. And there are parts where they come as, their, as themselves. They have a picture of themselves. They have their name. Uh, how important is that to Airbnb? How do you make that happen effectively? And what do you see its significance being? Certainly. Well, we only stand for real identities. That's core to the whole building of trust. And, and the vast majority of the public are like that anyways. It's only the, the small minority that uh, have this reputation that grabs the headlines, etc. A uh, couple things we do. So one, for convenience sake, you can sign up using Facebook Connect. And that just makes it really easy to get started and it pulls in all the relevant information and it creates a close link between what's on Airbnb and what's on Facebook. And, and Facebook has done a good job of creating uh, a, a trusted uh, environment. Uh, that's just the beginning though. Uh, we also have all different levels of things that we do. So as a host, you can say that I only want to accept reservations from people who have gone through our verified ID program. What verified ID means is that we will prompt the guest to upload a picture of their driver's license or passport, and we will recognize the characters on it, confirm that the details are correct, and also compare the name and other information to your Facebook account or something like that to cross-reference it. So we can do a, quite a sophisticated check uh, to make sure that everything, all these different sources of truth, all line up. So we can do that uh, if requested, and if anything looks out of the ordinary. So we have a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms that are monitoring everything that happens on the site. So everyone who does a search, everyone who signs up, who makes a booking, we look at the usage patterns. And if we see usage patterns that are unusual, we'll rate that user as more risky. And if they're more risky, then we'll ask them to prove that they are trustworthy by going through something like verified ID or another one of these processes. So you've made it. You have an incredibly successful company. It's incredibly satisfying, I suspect. You can tell your parents it's okay, worked out. They're, they're happy. Uh, your friends are impressed. Uh, is it still fun to come to work in the morning? Absolutely. And uh, why? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think we've actually made it yet. I mean, we've accomplished things that are beyond our wildest dreams for sure. But I also think today we can envision so much more that we can do than ever before. And so that's what makes it so exciting to come to work, to know that from where we are today, which is admittedly very far, um, we are in a better position than ever to change the world. Um, and so I think there's plenty to do with our core business, but there's plenty of innovation to do around the entire trip experience. Uh, so we're not just thinking about accommodation. We're thinking about what are all the conveniences and the, the value we can offer to make your trip more meaningful, more memorable. So we want to not only provide the accommodation or the connection with the host, but also all the local recommendations. What are those local spots that you're going to remember forever? Uh, what neighborhoods 
to how can we unlock the, the beautiful parts of the neighborhood and, and better connect you to this place that you're visiting and get you out of the, the touristy places to the places the locals like to go? Um, and how can we just connect you with people in general? Uh, we have such a critical mass of guests in a city at any given time. We have such a critical mass of hosts who have all kinds of local knowledge. How can we use our software and all our data to make things happen, connect people, share information, uh, such that people are having better trips, uh, more memorable experiences? Yeah, I can't help but think about uh, the dispersion of knowledge that Hayek talked about and how the Internet is actually helping to bring that together you know, obviously on any one night in any city, there are a bunch of people who are looking for interesting things to do. One of the things they want to do is meet the other interesting people who are looking for interesting things to do. We have some ways to do that now, but they're pretty primitive, I guess. So I think there's clearly a lot of potential there. I think what's amazing is that for a long time, a lot of the innovation that was happening online uh, was basically coming at the expense of the offline world. So people were spending more and more time online not connecting with each other. And now there's suddenly a transition of what I call online to offline. So it's, it's still online uh, technology, but it's more integrated with our offline lives and making it possible to derive value in your everyday. It's, it's almost um, totally integrated uh, with, you, with your everyday um, activities. I just want to mention we're getting some background noise here. We're recording this in a corner office on the fourth floor of a building in San Francisco, and there's some truck in... Uh, it's the 5 o'clock rush hour. 5 o'clock rush hour here in San Francisco. Um, any um, any big mistakes you made that are obvious now in retrospect that you hope you don't make again when you're doing the next expansion or whatever extension of what you're doing? Well, w when we have been so successful, it's hard to regret much. A lot has obviously gone right. Um, I will say that it wasn't easy. There was definitely some pain along the way. It's not easy to scale your company uh, so quickly. For the first couple of years, it was just Joe, Brian, and I. And then we started hiring people. But we're literally um, doubling the size of the company almost each year. Uh, we have close to 1,000 employees now. Uh, and that's a lot of new people to bring in and bring up to speed. Uh, that would be a challenge for any company. I think we've done it remarkably well. But when you have to figure this out and haven't necessarily done this before, you you need to, as quickly as possible, find the right leaders, bring them in. Uh, that is a hard thing to do when you don't have those professional networks. Luckily, our investors have been very helpful in that regard. Um, they have considerable networks. But I would have to say, if we were to do it again, you would have a lot more instincts about how to make those kinds of decisions quickly and know what you need. When you, you've never seen anything before, like this before, you don't have the perspective necessary to feel confident and make fast decisions sometimes. Um, and once you've seen it, then the next time around, you're, you have the pattern recognition. Let's talk about the regulatory environment. Um, in this space, this space is a lot of players in this, in this space. Uh, we've talked before on this program about Uber and being threatened by the taxi commission. Uh, hotels are not really happy that you're competing with them. Obviously, it's not just that, oh, you're getting the overflow. You're putting price pressure on their, their offerings. Um, and they're arguing that, hey, we have to face all these regulations on cleaning and hiring of people and inspections and safety. Uh, these poor people out here in the, on the web, they're renting these houses from strangers. They're at the mercy of this system. They need to be protected by the same regulations that protect our customers. Uh, what do you think of that argument? I know what you think of it. Don't tell me what you think of it. Tell me what you think it's going to be successful. Is it going to slow you down or stop you? Or are you, are you going to get some regulation that's going to make life harder for you? Well, the existing regulation uh, in most cases was made 30, 50, even 70 years ago and hasn't changed much since then. And certainly the times have changed. The technology has changed. Uh, the way we live our lives has changed. So I think it's totally fair game to say that these things should be updated from time to time. Uh, I do think it's time to have regulation that takes into account the 21st century that we live in. Uh, nobody is in favor of no regulation. Uh, well, just, don't be so sure, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are some very sensible rules that uh, should exist, and we would support those. At the same time, I think you have to be careful to assume that 
regulation is going to to um, have the intended consequence, uh, especially when you think that just six years ago, none of this existed. And so to think that we understand what's going to happen two years from now, I think would be a mistake. Uh, I think there's clearly something very special happening here in the sense that immense value is being created for guests, hosts, and cities alike, actually. We've done a lot of studies showing the value that's being generated for cities. Uh, And so I think it's important that we take the time to really understand the transformation that's happening and put into place uh, balanced regulation uh, and not just uh, react to the whims of, of different groups who are making quite a bit of noise about the fact that there is a what's perceived as a disruptive model. Now, what I'll say regarding hotels is that uh, hotels are now having their highest occupancy ever uh, and recording some of their highest nightly prices ever. So I don't think our success is coming at the expense of hotels. Um, I think that we've, we've done some studies and have found that a lot of people, when they travel, they actually stay with friends or family. And they're finding that Airbnb uh, is a good middle ground between staying with friends and family but not wanting to stay in a hotel that puts them in a different neighborhood and really disconnects them from the people they're visiting. And so you'll see a lot of our guests getting a place in the same neighborhood as the the people they're visiting. Uh, Just for one example of how we're actually increasing the size of the tourism pie. The thought I had, uh, we talked about this with Mike Munger, is that um, to a large extent, your trust system and the reviews that you generate on both sides of the transaction are the regulators, right? So the guest that came before me is the person who inspected the property for me. And uh, so in some sense, the technology and the way it brings people together is a substitute for regulation. I'd like to see the hotels move toward that way of guaranteeing their own business model rather than trying to, for them to extend the 50-year-old regulation to you as a way to, to deal with this change. The amazing thing about these systems, uh, these technology systems uh, for managing reputation, is that they take real-time feedback directly from the customer and make it visible to all. Uh, that's incredibly powerful. And if you think about the regulatory constructs that try to accomplish the same thing, they often involve inspections that happen annually. It's far from real time, and it's not necessarily reflective of the experience that the customer is having. So you're part of a wave. Um, We don't know what the full consequences of that wave will be, but I'm struck. It's just amazing how many people are trying to do what you've done with other things, whether it's your car parked at the airport or your pet uh, that needs to be housed somewhere. And so instead of putting it in a kennel, you house it with somebody who's already got a pet and is walking and their dog. And, you know, you have a more comfort about the fact that a dog lover is taking your dog rather than just a, a kennel. So the, this is exploding, right? Um, why did it take till now for this explosion to come? What do you think was the, obviously somebody had to have the idea. You guys are part of that that wave, but it's more than that. It's the technology alongside the idea. What's special about now that makes it work so well? I think the big barrier for a long time was trust. And people assumed that there wouldn't be trust or they didn't know how to foster it. Uh, and I think actually uh, Facebook and the, the kind of social uh, network age that we live in, where people's true identities are being truthfully represented online, has changed people's perception to, I mean, it it was only probably 10 or 15 years ago that the idea that someone's online profile was accurate was almost ridiculous. Um, Nobody would use their real name online uh, unless they were buying something. They wouldn't voluntarily put that out there. And now so much of our lives are online and we trust that that is as representative of the reality. Um, And so culturally, our our perspectives have, have shifted. And I think made space for um, for these new new business models. And I think, in a lot of ways, Airbnb has proven the model and furthered the trust of consumers and other entrepreneurs alike that this is uh, this is viable. Um, and thus, you see it also taking off um, in other other business verticals. 
and it's being re referred to as the sharing economy, the idea that people have underutilized assets or even their own time, and that technology now makes it possible to share that uh, quite, quite easily. How about the technology, though? Do you think smartphone, bandwidth, is that part of the story, too? Well, absolutely. So mobile is all about removing the friction in the transaction. So people are always connected to the Internet. It's right in their pocket. And so when somebody sends a message on Airbnb to a host, the host gets a, a real-time notification in their pocket and can respond immediately. And so that removes the friction from the transaction, meaning that the customer gets almost a real-time response. And that's much more satisfying than if the person had to run home um, or not come home for uh, several hours or a day uh, and have a delayed response. So it seems to me that when we think about all these sharing pieces of the economy, whether it's cars, houses, time, whatever it's going to end up being, a huge part of it's got to be the, the backbone, the back room, the logistics part of it that matches people, that helps people search, that helps people rate, that deals with dis disagreements. Um, have you thought about going into that business instead of being into the – I mean, you're talking about extending your business to different aspects of travel. It seems to me you ought to be selling your technology to other companies that want to expand – that you don't particularly necessarily want to be involved in, but let them use that software that you've put together. Well, that might be a good opportunity. I'm not sure, but you just you have to prioritize. Uh, honestly, there's, there's still so much to do just in our core business that it's important to main focus. What do you think is the future of online uh, marketplaces and the sharing economy? Do you f are you optimistic about the regulatory issues? And do you think we've you think Airbnb has just scratched the surface? Do you think other areas are going to be uh, equally important besides just staying overnight at somebody's house? Sure. Well, every different business vertical is is different. Uh, that being said, I think a lot of them are showing immense promise regarding regulatory. I would say that. So much value has been created and unleashed, and that's not lost on consumers. Guests and hosts alike, and increasingly cities, are recognizing the value proposition here. And so uh, I think the rules will be adapted to promote what makes sense uh, and take a balanced perspective. So I'm very optimistic in the long term that this can be worked out. Certainly in the short term, um, you know, it's a little bit, <laughs> little bit random what can happen with politics. Uh, but in the long term, I'm quite confident. Let's talk for a minute about big data. Uh, it's a kind of a fad. I'm a little bit skeptical about it, but uh, obviously you're learning a lot about people's habits, preferences, desires, what's important to them. Just from the search, ha search habits, you, you've learned a lot about that, but especially about what they choose and what they care about and what they do over and over again. I'm not talking about privacy issues about who goes to New York. I'm thinking about just the whole texture of our travel existence and, and how we feel about privacy, how we feel about sharing, how we feel about staying with strangers, what makes that worthwhile. You have some really extraordinary information. Um, how often do you guys think about that, talk about it, uh, and maybe use it? Yeah, that's an important ingredient to, to our success, I would say. So... A core thing that we provide is that we match guests with hosts. So how do we do the matching? Well, we use data, of course. And what we're looking at is, well, first of all, which properties are more popular? What does that mean? It means not just which ones are getting bookings, but which properties did people look at? And then if they looked at them, did they book it or not? And if someone is looking at a property but then not booking it, then maybe something's wrong with it. And can we infer what's wrong with it based on how much time people spent and what they were looking at on the screen. So there's actually remarkable signal that you can collect to understand uh, what's, what you have happening on, on your platform and how to better make those connections and manage that inventory. In a place like Paris where we have 30,000 properties and you do a search for Paris, how do we know which one we should display first? Whatever we display first should hopefully be something that you're likely uh, to like and book. And so to actually discreetly rank every single property takes a lot of uh, things into consideration. And, and that's all big data. What's your um, feeling about 
about America. You're in a very unusual part of the country. Uh, you're in a part of the country, or actually, we're, we're in a part, not just a part of the country, we're not just in a part of, so we're not just in California, we're not just in San Francisco, we're in a part of San Francisco that has a lot of these types of creative, extraordinary companies uh, in the neighborhood. I just walked from the Caltrain station and passed Pinterest, I saw an ad for Lyft, uh, I saw a ship, there's just a lot of stuff going on. This place is very vibrant. A lot of the country, not so vibrant. Some places, we're still struggling with the aftermath, the recession. Are you optimistic? A lot of people are worried that, you know, not only is their um, the economy not doing well, but it's not going to do well in the future because technology is going to displace too many people. You know, you've, you've got a thousand employees, you said, something like that. And here you are, this incredibly large company, and you're, you manage to do what you do with so few people. I view that as a plus. <laughs> That's a feature, not a bug for me. But it worries a lot of people. What are your thoughts on that generally in uh, the future of the of the country, right? Of the I th- economy. I think what you're saying is, generally speaking, uh, the opportunities that are ver- available require that you have a, a specialized skill or background, such as being a computer programmer, uh, and that job is such high leverage that it eliminates other jobs uh, potentially. I actually think this is something that's really interesting about the sharing economy which is that the sharing economy is allowing regular people to rent out their homes, their pets, their cars, provide rides, do all these things with what they've got. And it doesn't require that they have any sort of special degree. Uh, In the case of Airbnb, all you just have to be a decent human being, pretty much, and reliable, keep your promises. Correct. If you have a home and you can provide reasonable hospitality, you're a friendly person, then you can derive an income on Airbnb. That's, that's a, a pretty profound thing. It's an opportunity that's open to any American. Um, and in a time where there are fewer and fewer opportunities, it's amazing to see new ecosystems open up uh, that can spread the wealth and create, uh, create value for both guests and hosts alike. It really lets... Yeah, every, anybody can be an entrepreneur because as you point, what's interesting about it to me is that you think, well, I'll just put my house online. But of course, there's how you present it, there's how you photograph it, there's how you greet the guest and how you follow up and a thousand other little details that make some people better at it than others. And anybody can work at it and get better at it if they want. That's absolutely right. It's funny you say entrepreneur. We actually refer to our hosts as micro entrepreneurs. Right. And that's because we basically give them um, a toolkit kind of get started, a little bit of instruction uh, in terms of how to present themselves online and, and we take care of the payments and the trust. Um, but they can otherwise just kind of plug themselves in and really take control of their, their economic future uh, and, and derive a meaningful stream of income. And we've also actually heard that through the people that they meet by providing this, the kind of networking that goes on opens up additional opportunities for them. Uh, and that they sometimes take their, their earnings on Airbnb and that kind of entrepreneurial mindset that they develop and start applying that to, to other things, new small businesses uh, that they, they then create. My guest today has been Nathan Blacharzik. Nathan, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.